I was in a school here in Wellington yesterday and a teacher who, for whom I've got a lot of respect, a great teacher, said to me, Lester, national standards have gone, but what are we going to do now? A teacher said last week in response to something I've written about um, standardised normative tests and so on, but we need these, otherwise how will we know that children have actually reached the level that they need to reach? There are about 100 or so people here today, there are 26,000 plus teachers out there, so leading the way is a huge task, a complex task, to shift the thinking that's been sort of drummed down into teachers over the last uh, almost decade. Now, um, so we've been experiencing a period of the weight, force and drive of top-down political machinery with scant regard or respect for the response and the positions of the great non-aligned, of which I am one, proudly to say. Yet, it has nonetheless been quite popular with many of the great unwashed. And that is something that we have to think about, how we communicate um, the... Uh, the significance of the New Zealand curriculum and all it stands for and means. In Alice in Wonderland, she says, which way should I go? The cat says, oh, it depends on which way you, you are going, but I don't know which way I'm going, then it doesn't matter which way you're going. Well, taking the lead actually begs big questions about in which direction. It's not as uncomplicated as we might like to sing at this forum. Um, in whose direction? Who is actually going to be taking the lead this time? Because, as you'll see in some of my models, it's not been new people, by and large, when it comes to the greater curricular um, terrain. And how is that lead going to take place? Whenever we consider these sort of questions, we have to consider the context, I believe, of the past, as well as the present, and contemplating what the future might be. So here is a timeline of curriculum development over the years, blue for national, red for labour. Tomorrow's schools really signalled a huge shift in how schools work in this school. Longy said it was about the administration of schools, but he was followed hard on the heels by a national government who changed what the agenda would be about. Um, prior to tomorrow's schools, um, curriculum it was pretty haphazard in the way it was actually done, but it was quite consistent, a lot of it, with the ideals that we have today. Then, of course, um, change of government, and it's all about sort of snakes and leaders, really. We go up, we come down. And here I'm sort of borrowing one of Tom Scott's, uh, a title of one of Tom Scott's books. Uh, here are the leaders over the years. Prior to David Longy, um, we'd have Merv Wellington up there, you know, the, the flag man. Um, there wasn't a great deal of politicisation um, in terms of curricula in this country. It really came very much from then the Department of Education. But then things changed. Along came, for example, Lockwood Smith, the great quiz master, remember? Um, Lockwood Smith, who introduced his achievement initiative. And his achievement initiative led to these things called levels, achievement objectives, assessment, and above all, accountability. And these were developed, these curriculum statements, by groups of contractors according to a formulaic recipe provided by the Ministry of Education. Look at the size of that one. This is what was actually before it, something like this. And a very, very good maths curriculum like this. Now, I hold these up because... Substantially, if you do the analysis, a lot of what is in this has been carried across into this. And I'll elaborate on that further on. Politicians and politics, they work on the principle that you'll forget. Look at that one there, for example. 2005, every child turning nine will be able to read and write and so on. Now, that's what the public hears, and the public likes those messages. And whatever the government comes up with as a formula for addressing that, the public says, national standards. What's wrong with national standards? And I must just poke in there. I don't think there's anything wrong with standards. It's a particular system, the particular criteria, and other things that were at fault. Then I asked um, the first minister with this particular government uh, what her um, vision was for a good primary education for New Zealand's children. And she quickly bounced up and said, our focus must be on the basics, and by this I mean a clear focus on literacy and numeracy. I can still remember vividly her almost chastising me at this Queenstown conference I was speaking at. So what happened was that the New Zealand curriculum got pushed into the background, as we all know. 
the promise of innovation and localization, um, which were, I think, quite high on this matrix, were overridden by um, the prescriptive nature of national standards. What we've ended up with is a, what I've called a fixation of a theorised, jargonised, idealised, fanaticised view of what curriculum should be all about. And I'd think of a lot of other words that could go with that, but that's enough for now. Then, this has particularly interested me because I've heard a lot of discussions about the demise of national standards. And so I often like to use this to remind people that this should be the reference point about the worth of national standards, especially for those who love them. John Key said, amongst other things, he's concerned that one in five children were failing, and he went on to say, that is why the national league government is introducing national standards for all years one to eight schools. That was the reason for national standards according to the Prime Minister of the time. That was the reason. Let's not go past that. And this is what was the result when you look at the graph. Looks like an, a, a fence line. In fact, you can put a level on it. <laughs> then what happened when um, the Labour government says we're going to get rid of national standards, we get a narrative change from Bill English. Um, in Morning Report, he says that we have, need national standards. Parents want them to know how their children are doing. So it's basically they're about achievement. So now there's a big shift from the one in five, never worked, never been admitted to, to no, people want these because they want to know whether their child is achieving. And the great unwashed will agree with that. This is a, this is a political discourse that fires up the view of education and what it should be about out there, outside this room of 100 and so people. In my view, um, governments, politicians, they've got three major responsibilities. One, they've got a right to establish policies in the service of their citizens, equitable policies. They've got that right. It's part of the democratic system. I also believe that they've got a responsibility to attend to grounded, objective advice when forming and deciding their policies. And I also believe that they've got a duty to be open and close friends of the truth. <laughs> Hekia Parata. But then you get this sort of talk from um, the belated acting interim prime minister. This government has the capacity to make its own decisions between good advice and bad. Advice we disagree with is bad advice. Advice we agree with is good advice. A, a nice quote from Martin Frupp's book. So policy consequences. What have been the consequences of policy over time? This is what it was in my day, because it wasn't mentioned, but I was also a teacher once upon a time. We had these sort of, what I've called, networks of curriculum communities. And we had them for all of the different learning areas. We had social, social studies, science, PE, art, art, and music, quite separate in those days and such like. We had them in the Department of Education with the Curriculum Development Unit, some marvellous people in there. Um, who were the great connectors, the leaders of bringing together the, the discourse around the country. We had colleges of education people um, who were staffed by successful practitioners who had a real thing about science, or a real thing about maths or music. They'd proven themselves to be great educators. Um, we had subject associations around the country. I was a member of a number of them, and the NZEI had curriculum advisory committees as well. I was a member of the Arts One, a national advisory committee. So what has happened? Pop, 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 they've all gone. Even the networks of arrows have gone, and we've been left with one arrow, and now it's like this. Fundamentally, we've got sort of closed shops, closed doors, all those sorts of things. Leave your cell phone and your computer outside the room when you come to this meeting about what we're going to be doing for the system. And uh, the drive down is going to be reading, writing, and maths. And I should have put technology there as well. Um, very quickly, what has greatly interested me over the recent um, two or three weeks, really, is there's been quite a lot of media commentary about what is starting to happen in education. And this concerns me because um, it's frequently ill-informed, frequently unbalanced, giving one-sided messages. And I've put this, these slides in here because, to me, this is one of the areas that we've got to lead. We've got to lead, take our voice out into a wider public forum. We've got to help to educate the public. Um, so taking the lead, 
data, evidence, measurement, assessment, all these sorts of things. This is what we've basically had. Right through the election campaign, one was really all the time pointing towards achievement. Here's a man, a teacher who taught his children, um, told me that he wanted to know why they couldn't tell him the children's place in the class, primary school children, when his kids were at primary school up in the hut there at the school. Um, and Chris Hipkins has been constantly talking about its progress. Now, I could actually spend the rest of the day talking about the issues of um, making distinctions between achievement and progress, because they believe belong together. You can't measure progress without measuring achievement, but it's how you actually locate what it's on about. So, in this editorial from the Otago Daily Times, New Zealand's last major national daily newspaper that's privately owned, schools will continue to report to parents twice a year about the progress that the children have made in areas of the curriculum, not just reading, writing and maths. Already there's some prescription coming in here. I anticipate that will probably come through in the nags. And then, I mean, this is from the inductable John Hattie. We're moving down in maths, reading, writing, and now we need to worry about our students' resilience. It's not just the students below the average going down, we're also moving backwards with those above average, and the slide is for all. He said schools needed to have higher expectations. How many years have I heard this being said? Higher expectations for all their pupils and measure how much each pupil has progressed um, each year, not just how many achievement standards. He says New Zealand's going through an angst over national standards and maybe it was not the best way to achieve them, he said. I was a fan of them. I could tell you a lot more about John Hattie's role with national standards and yet he is one of the gurus in this country going down. Again, this is a huge topic and I know I've got strong reservations about some of the international tests that's shown through NIMPSA and NEMP um, and as well as Pearl's Pizza, Tim's and so on, that our tra trajectory is like this in maths and so on. So we need to ask why. The New Zealand Herald said, the fact is that such a significant decline is something that we should really wake up to and pay attention to. Now, when the matter of progress came up, I reflected back on a group that I was involved with, with Rosemary and, and John Hattie and company. They put together a group of people who have quite different views, and we had to come away with the same view, so it was quite an interesting task. Um, and assessment for directions uh, in assessment in New Zealand was the name of this, uh, this um, paper that we had to prepare, and it was being ostensibly prepared to help guide uh, national policy on assessment in the New Zealand education system. It says, we advocate the development of rich descriptions of progress over time, progressions, and clearly defined indicators of achievement relative to different stages of learning. Given then John Hattie, I said, well, that's not currently in our curriculum. And John said, well, the curriculum is rubbish. I can still remember him saying this, if it can't do that. But it won't do it, it can't do it. So all this talk about progressions, there's not actually um, a stairway to doing that within this document. And that is one of the big issues that has to be faced. So we admitted in this report, given the shortage of good examples of progressions, whether local and international, exactly what making progress means for different areas of the curriculum needs to be determined through research and professional deliberations of teachers and school leaders. That's a big job. And it's, not, and it's going to take more than three years to do it well. You need to think beyond three yearly blocks. But that is one of the challenges. This was a great celebratory photograph in the Otago Daily Times of a principal dumping the national standards. Um, but in this article, the ministry spokesperson said schools will still be required to report to parents at least twice a year in their child's progress and achievement, especially in the foundational areas of maths, reading and writing. Somehow we've got to get a shift in culture from the top a new way of thinking, a wider way of thinking. So some of those people in the top, as I've said in some articles I've written that you might have read, it's time for them to move aside to the Ministry of Fisheries or somewhere like that. Um, <coughs> in, the, in the Herald, the Wanganui Intermediate Principal, many of us know Charles Oliver, a good man, he says, um, so they were never national and never all standardised, but we need to know what will replace them. And I'm, I think I might have even heard this this morning. And I'm wondering why people are saying this. What do you mean by replacing them? Replacing them. There's something wrong in the thinking. 
there was so much good that was going on, we need to have resurrection. <laughs> but there are academics, measurement people, measurement specialists, they're called experts, who are developing modelling, like um, visible learning. You know who the visible learning man is? Yes, John Hattie's work. Um, I mean, I quite like John. He's a good guy to go in a taxi with, talk about cricket. Um, and here they are now modelling ways of actually uh, that schools can use. They've got a, a class roll down the side there and how you can put a matrix of how much progress they're making in relation to their achievement. As uh, Broadford, um, English academic, wonderful person, said, an obsession with measurement not only dominates the means we choose to achieve our ends, but is increasingly becoming the end in itself. A world in which cannot be measured in a systematic way is deemed to not exist. I can't say it any better than that. James Pop, an American, data inclines most educators to think good thoughts laced with notions of evidence, science and rigour, but data shouldn't elicit this. Um, amongst right-thinking educators. Indeed, we should spurn some data. I like to put everything into context of learning. Um, a friend and colleague of mine, Prof. Jeff Smith at Otago, said, you know, one day we're having a chat, and he said, you know, if a college program was just entirely based on theories of learning, about what learning is all about, and we really got that into teachers' heads, um, it might really make a huge difference into how we think. This is a lovely, straightforward statement, there's always 10 points in the list, of 10 things about learning, which I think is every man's guide to theory of learning. And they say in here, amongst other things, it's diverse and different for every individual. I mean, this is the sort of thinking that's really got to find concretion in how we approach curriculum. Learning is linear and erratic, and yet, and here we are, learning is different and diverse for each learner. This is something that really strikes me when I go around the country about how different kids are. I mean, that is the reality. One size will not fit all. Some kids might need to be in an ability group. And then there's this notion of linearity. Um, measuring progress and achievement is founded on assumptions of linearity. And you know the great... Um, the antagonist of linearity is um, the TED Talk man. What's his name? He's in New Zealand. Sorry? Ken Robinson. Ken Robinson. I mean, learning progressions, up we go. But in reality, it's like that. That is the truth. As a teacher, I thought these kids have got it. Next week, <laughs> it's gone. It's up there. I mean... It's fundamental things, like you go into a school and you look at their long-term plan and they have um, sort of the, the numeracy stuff and then they're going to do some uh, geometry in week five of term one and again in week one in term four, that's it. All the learning in week five of term one goes out there. It is, it's overlooking fundamentals of learning theory which involve practice, repetition, all that sort of thing. Uh, we had a wonderful international symposium um, in Queenstown a few years ago, to, and um, the members of the symposium then went to Dunedin and had a working group, um, a collection of uh, international specialists, they like to be called experts, um, in assessment, and spent about a morning coming up with a definition of assessment for learning. And this is the definition, assessment for learning that they came up with. It's part of everyday practice by students, teachers and peers that seeks, reflects upon and responds to information from dialogue, demonstration, observations in ways that enhance ongoing learning. I can read that to you in five seconds more or less. For teachers to actually understand what this means for practice is going to require a big, big paradigm shift. We've got to have confidence in this. I mean, I don't, when I go to the doctor, he doesn't need to weigh me to see if I'm overweight. He doesn't need to do a test on me to find out if I've got a cold or the flu. Teachers need to be able to reach the same point because you know your children so well through your ongoing interaction that you've, can, you've got the information there. I think the OTJ is a wonderful, wonderful uh, construct for assessment, but it requires a lot of professional development. And many of you have seen my ideal of the healthy assessment pyramid. I'm not saying get rid of standardised tests altogether. Um, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a place for them. 
taking the lead. Um, schools no longer need to report national standards. Um, the New Zealand Principals Federation uh, president said in, in this article here, um, our broad, broad world-class curriculum. The president of the NZDI in this article in the Herald said, our world-leading curriculum. I've asked many people, why is it classified as world-leading? Oh, overseas people, because I've looked at lots of curricular documents from different countries, and they've got things like key competences in there as well. Um, so you have to say, well, what is it that can justify us calling this, this just, just being sort of Antipodean, insular, um, little educators again in the small community in the small fish pond? Or is it a statement of bold truth of reality? Well, when we were developing the curriculum, we had to try to define what its direction would be all about. And this is what it was. And the ministry, when I showed this slide once, said, oh, where did you get that from? I said, from your working papers, remember? Oh, that's right, they had to go and find them. It was about rationalising learning outcomes. What learning? How much? It's not the same learning for all kids. It's not the same amount of learning for all kids. It's about quality teaching and school ownership localisation. What does that mean? I mean, these things have been said before, time and time and time again. Education development conferences that were held back in the 70s, a great collaborative nationwide sets of forums. Um, the reports from that says we need to have a balanced curriculum, we need to provide a framework, we need to ensure that progress, student progress is monitored, progress, progress, and ensure that there's freedom within the guidelines that it's real and not illusory. Um, it's been there, now you can read on the website, there's, there's a move, there's a shift internationally, Bye-bye, core subjects. Hello, rounded education. It's not just in New Zealand. The curriculum review of um, uh, Mr. Marshall, who was Minister of Education for a while, said each school will need to plan its own curriculum to conform with the national curriculum guidelines in ways that are appropriate. So, I mean, it's been out there. It's been out there for a long time. We've got to pick it up and make it real. Even the OECD has said, give schools more freedom. But we've got to be very professional about this. We've got to be quite rigorous about it. On TV last week, News Hub, we saw an example of um, what I've called a localisation in terms of a context for learning, uh, predator control. Did anybody see that snip? I thought it was wonderful what the kids were doing. They're developing knowledge, skills, insights. There's a lot of the key competencies were at play uh, in this, um, what I think is wonderful exercise. And then it's also content of learning, localising localizing and rationalising. Um, I did a study with some principals, a research thing on um, ASTL, uh, for a conference, and I said to one of the teachers interviewing, um, how are you treating this data? She said, I'll tell you how I treat it, Esther. Um, my kids are not scoring very well on this and this when I do the analysis. She said, but I'm, I'm not worried about that. That's, she said, because that's not what these kids need. So, but it has affected their score. See, so scores are always vulnerable to those sort of decisions. She was a very, very good teacher. She was, she was localising it within her classroom according to those kids' priority needs. I mean, just take a look at our curriculum. All of these achievement objectives that we have, there are heaps of them. Some people have counted them. Then we've got the standards. And if you read these, um, for example, for year eight writer and reader, you have to say, well, I haven't really seen many of those kids around. Some of my postgraduate students were not shining in respect to some of these year eight things. And that is part of the problem, the definition of what the particular criteria are for kids for their learning. The levels, I mean, two year, I think theoretically this is a superb um, depiction of what it's about, superb. And I noticed, by the way, the ministry took it off the curriculum version on their website a few years ago. They removed it and put it in blocks um, in, in line with the national standards. But it's not satisfying us very well because parents, by and large, do want to know where their kids are at. And the levels, they do not understand them. We've got to try and fix that. I mean, look at the nonsense of the achievement objectives. An um, one example, level one, language features, they use some oral, written and visual language features to create meaning and effect. At your level two, they use oral, uh, written and visual language features to create meaning and effect. So you take the word some out. Okay, I bet they only use some. I bet they're only at level one. 
Um, level two uses oral, written, and um, visual language features to create meaning and effect and engage interest. Don't engage interest at level one. <laughs> level one kids don't engage. In, I mean, this is nonsensical. <laughs> These achievement objectives are nonsensical. When this was published, I said they should be stapled shut. Well, today I'm going to be more dramatic. They should be ripped out <laughs> and thrown away. This is the part we've got to focus on. I could give you a lot more examples. A level can only be regarded as an inadequate assignment of an inaccurate judgment by a biased and variable judge to the extent to which the student has attained an undefined amount of mastery of an unknown proportion of an indefinite amount of material. But what we've found, what has happened in the teaching world is knitting industries have been created. I've seen them everywhere. Knitting up long lists, checklists, um, assessment lists, data lists. We've got to get rid of the knitters and the head knitters in particular. <laughs> I know of a school here in Wellington where the head knitter is a DP, that's all she does is works on data. And all the teachers have to knit to the her pattern. <laughs> One size fits all. Uh, to sum up, I think that we need to seriously work very hard to work out how we can get a paradigm shift in respect to curriculum. Currently, this seems to be the paradigm. We've got the minister, we've got the minister's minions, agents, gatekeepers, door holders, contractors, controllers, spinners and weavers. We've got favoured on-song theorists, academics and researchers. Favoured ones. The same names pop up all the time, and yet there are some other great names around this country that I'd like to see in there. And some of them are sitting in this room right now. And then you've got the practitioners sitting down below. It should be shifting from this to this. That's where we've got to get the focus. So in summing up, taking the lead, some starters. Changing the guard. Lead, the reinstatement of curriculum and assessment leadership to hands and heads that are properly knowledgeable, experienced, visionary, grounded and balanced. Much of the present guard, national standards, numeracy project, um, literacy progressions is now the old guard and should be confined to the barracks. <laughs> networks of curricular communities lead the resurrection of networks of curricular communities that are owned by the teaching profession and respected by system workers. When I uh, showed this to some teachers, I said, oh, but we've got that in the coals. We have not. The coals are not going to achieve what the Minister claimed they were going to achieve. Uh, but that is another half hour talk. <laughs> if you want some really good, hard, strong thinking on that, go to the um, Teachers' Council website and look at their think papers, and um, in particular one that was written by um, Jane... Jane Gilbert is absolutely superb. It's only four pages long, but read it five times. <laughs> Teachers as the curriculum literate. Lead initiatives that significantly strengthen and empower every principal and teacher to be fully New Zealand curriculum literate. Because I have to tell you that over the years, I've been around a lot of schools, a lot of places, I actually think the level of curriculum literacy it's not a very big document, but I think it's quite low. That's my assessment. It's quite low. It's very surface level. It's got to be more than a celebration. Uh, we've got to get right back to what are the ingredients that we're going to cook up for the party. Front up, back off. I've demonstrated that. Uh, lead the adamant determination to hold the front section as it is and replace the back section with learning goals that are uncomplicated, jargon-free, realistic, few for each year level, and unambiguous in distinguishing progression from one year level to the next. I think that is a very important challenge for us, a big challenge, but one that's got to be done, because the others have not worked. They're very confusing. Um, assessment for learning lead a resolute swing away from the industry of summative measures and data-driven improvement mythology towards genuine practices of assessment for learning. Resistance, somebody said, oh, you're far too emotive in the way you're putting these together. Um, you've got to be emotive. That's part of the persuasive te uh, technique. Persistent resistance to any hint 
of return to the manufacture of wads of assessment checklists, data files, etc., and any approbation, endorsement, or encouragement of these corruptive, corrosive, and time-robbing practices by government agents. It should not be tolerated. <laughs> and very importantly, media messaging. Lead from the front and proactively communicating and reassuring, I think this is most important, the general public about the direction of the New Zealand curriculum and its power for helping prepare children to learn, live and prosper in an ever-changing and very challenging world. We're going to do this in order to avoid the, the snakes and leaders of, sw of swings and roundabouts from the political um, sphere. Something like this. We're going to start to learn to lead together, to come into the same thinking space and not be led from those up above. So what is there to celebrate today? Well, from my view, basically it's opportunity. It's not celebrating the curriculum as such. We did that celebration over a bottle of wine when it was first printed. Um, we've got to celebrate now that we've got opportunity again. There's opportunity. And above all, we have to remember that all of this is about children. Hence I showed you that slide of different children before. I've worked on many advisory committees over the years and sometimes I felt like saying to them, hey look, it's time we went outside and looked at children. Children. Um, they have a very short space, I believe passionately in this, a very short space um, in their whole lifespan of actually being children. And I think that it's our role, our moral responsibility to allow them to have and enjoy Childhood. Childhood.